Hello everybody, it's Dr. Shuharthi Kaur. I am a nephrologist working in Silat MAJ Osmani Medical College, Bangladesh. On behalf of social media team of War Congress of Nephrology 2019, I am here with uh, Professor Praveer Rai Choudhury. Uh, he's a nephrologist working in USA. Professor Choudhury, can you please uh, tell me about the importance of learning interventional nephrology on the part of nephrologists? No, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I think the reason uh, to learn about interventional nephrology or for nephrologists to be active in interventional nephrology is that it is a subspecialty that I think will allow nephrologists to provide an overall and holistic care for the vascular access of their patients. In particular, what I want to say is that Interventional nephrology is not just about doing procedures, although that is very, very important. Interventional nephrology is also about understanding about the biology and the epidemiology and the clinical research aspects and the process of care of vascular access. And we need to be able to do that to provide good care, holistic care to our patients. What is the benefit of knowing the biology behind the maturation and failure of every fistula? I think the importance of uh, understanding a little bit about the biology and about the basic and translational science of vascular access is that it gives you a better appreciation of what procedures can or cannot do. It gives you a better appreciation and understanding of the sorts of people you should do angioplasty on and perhaps where you shouldn't. It can help you understand how many angioplasties are too many in some patients. Okay, thank you. Now, what are the future prospects of devices like BMS? That's a very good question. I think that it is uh, very encouraging that there are a large number of newer devices that are coming onto the market. Uh, we have uh, drug eluting balloons, uh, we have uh, stent crafts, uh, we uh, potentially could have newer therapies uh, uh, such as wraps or drugs that you drip onto the fistula to try and enhance the maturation. However, I will say that uh, I think we need more data on these newer therapies. I think that the results of clinical trials on some of these newer therapies uh, like uh, vonapanitase, the serolimus wrap, uh, the tissue, bi the bioengineered vessels are going to come out in the future. Uh, and I think once we have those data, we need to try and fit some of these novel therapies into the process of care of vascular access, keeping in mind that we want to do the right thing by the patient and keeping in mind issues like cost as well. Okay. You always tell us the hemodialysis room is a source of data. Why do you say so? Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, mentioning that. I and many others have, have always felt that if you're thinking about clinical research, that within the hemodialysis unit, you have all of the different things that you need to successfully do clinical research. So you have uh, physicians, you have nurses, uh, you could bring in coordinators, uh, you have most importantly patients that come in three times a week and you have wonderful follow-up on these patients in terms of really hard and important endpoints like death and hospitalization. And then you have the ability to take blood samples and you have a database uh, that really is quite extensive in terms of labs and in terms of what's happened to the patient. And despite having all these things in the dialysis unit, we are really doing very little research in the dialysis unit. And I have just felt that it is such a lost opportunity that we are not harnessing all of these different strengths and really making the dialysis unit a hub for clinical research, a hub for innovation. So this is another question. How do you find prospect of artificial mechanical kidney in future? Right. I think that uh, uh, it's a good time. Uh, for thinking about really novel and innovative forms of renal replacement therapy. Uh, and I say that for two reasons. So number one, I think that there have been significant advances in 
in technologies like better membranes, miniaturization and sensors, all of which can feed into things like a wearable, a portable, a, an implantable or a bioengineered kidney. But in addition to the science, I think what has also happened in the last couple of years is that we are beginning to have regulatory bodies and reimbursement bodies that are interested in trying to bring these novel technologies into patients. And in particular, through the Kidney Health Initiative, which is a public-private partnership between the American Society of Nephrology and the FDA, we have developed a roadmap for innovative renal replacement therapy, again going all the way from enhanced dialysis to a portable, to a wearable, to an implantable kidney. And we hope that this roadmap will function as a catalyst for these novel types of artificial kidneys to come into patients. And in addition, we also have a kidney innovation accelerator in the United States, but whose scope is, I think, throughout the world that aims to try and provide funding for innovative uh, ideas and projects in the area of renal replacement therapy. So you put the two together, better technologies and public policy changes. I think the future is exciting, but again, I, I think issues like uh, uh, getting this these advances out to everybody in the world and issues like cost and access remain very, very important. Thank you. You're a nephrologist from uh, USA. So I have a question, why uh, peritoneal dialysis is not that much popular in USA? So I, I will preface that by saying that I think the reason is that uh, it's a mindset issue and a practice pattern issue. And uh, I think I personally and many people in the US uh, are clearly trying to uh, increase the number of patients on home dialysis, whether it's peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis. And I think it's very much, uh, uh, it's a mindset issue, it's a practice pattern issue, and uh, there's no question, I think that there should be much more people who are on peritoneal dialysis uh, in the US and really, I would say, all over the world. Uh, because other than a few countries, Hong Kong, Thailand, Canada and Mexico to some extent, uh, I think uh, we should be utilizing peritoneal dialysis a lot, lot more. My last question, why you love your work as an nephrologist or why did you have become a nephrologist? So I think the reason that I like what I do as an academic nephrologist is, is twofold. Uh, so one at the patient level, I think that nephrologists have a holistic view when it comes to taking care of patients because they are involved not just in the kidney problems of their patients but in their heart problems and in their leg problems and in their psychosocial problems and in their socioeconomic problems quite frankly. And so I think that that is a very nice part about nephrology in that you are a specialist in a complex uh, area but at the same time you're still taking care of the whole patient and for kidney patients things start off with the kidney but then they branch out into many other areas. The second part of my job that I like as an academic and I'm very grateful to for this is that in addition to looking after patients I can also be involved in technology development and translational science and clinical research and public policy. And I think I'm incredibly lucky to have the ability to participate in these four domains that ultimately feed into patient care. So I, I'm incredibly lucky as an academic to be able to do this. Thank you, Professor Chaudhary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.